You know, Thomas Edison is acclaimed to be one of the greatest inventors in history. Yet, if you went back and looked at his story, it didn't start too well. Did you know that after three months in his academic pursuits, the teacher came to him and said, he came to his mom and said, your son's just not going to cut it. You need to take him home. Three months into his academic career, he was sent home. And yet, if you look at his life, he is responsible. He's credited with some of the most incredible inventions, including the incandescent light bulb, the phonograph, and the fluoroscope, just to name a few. Most of his inventions, though, required months, if not years, to discover. And he had one failure after another failure after another failure, one obstacle after another obstacle, in order to, to find this in order to see any results. Well, in 1921, he was interviewed and he described his persistence this way. He says, after we had conducted thousands of experiments on a certain project without solving the problem, one of my associates expressed total discouragement and disgust over having failed yet another time without finding out anything. And I cheerily assured him we had learned something. We had learned with certainly what we had tried was not the correct way and that we needed to try it again differently. I like that. See, the truth is, many people in life, they miss out because they don't know how to get back up. And when it comes to joy, many people miss out on joy because of their inability to see an obstacle as an opportunity, to see their circumstances as something that God has given them to help them and not to hurt them. And yet we learn from this passage today, what we're going to look at, that if we're going to have joy, if we're, going to, if we're going to overcome, then we have to learn how to remain faithful. And that's what Paul speaks to. Paul says, let me show you how to remain faithful so that you can experience the joy of knowing and serving God. And he says the key is remaining faithful to the gospel. Remaining faithful to the good news that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Now that may sound strange, but what Paul's going to do, he's going to teach us how to remain faithful. And he says the first way that we do that is that we have to, well, he gives us four things. He says, if you're going to remain faithful, you got to learn how to remain fearless. You got to learn how to remain focused you got to learn how to remain fruitful, and you got to learn how to remain fervent. Now, for those of you who just joined us, last week we started a series in the book of Philippians. It's called re. Yes, I'm talking about the prefix re. The word re is one of four primary prefixes that make up 95% of all words that use prefixes. I thought that was interesting. The word means again and again. It means to do it over. It means to come back to. Sometimes it means to have a little bit of backward motion. So like the word revert means to go back to. The word repeat means to say it again. The word repent means to turn from sin back to God. And yet we find through Scripture number of words, repent, reconcile, restitution, things like that, where God says, I want you to come back to me. Where Paul, in this letter, he's trying to encourage this church that was of great encouragement to him. He says, there are, there are five things that I want you to learn how to do so that you would have joy in following Jesus. He says the first, and we talked about this last week, remember your partnership in the gospel. Today, we're going to look at what it means to remain faithful to your heavenly calling. Next week, we'll look at what it means to reimagine life with a godly attitude. Then reconsider the cost of fellowship. And then last, we're going to look at what he says to rejoice in, your, in the walk with the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. So today, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 26, we're going to look at what it means to remain faithful. Now, the word remain means to continue to exist by possessing a particular quality or fulfilling a specific role. It means to continue to exist. It means to continue to have purpose by possessing a particular quality, whether it's intestinal fortitude, whether it's spiritual encouragement. He says you have this particular call, uh, calling upon your life and you are willing to fulfill that specific role. And so Paul says, for us, we have to remain faithful in the gospel. And where he begins is this. And I love, here's what I like about Paul here. Paul's not going to say, hey, you guys go do this. What Paul has done 
It's modeled it for us. If there was anyone that we could learn a lesson about remaining faithful, it's the Apostle Paul. He says the first thing you got to do in verses 12 to 14, he says you have to remain fearless. See, in spite of opposition, the gospel must progress. And there's no greater joy for a believer than seeing the gospel progress. There's no greater joy as a believer than, than God using you to see someone else come to faith in Christ. Paul was a man obsessed with the gospel. He was a man who wanted anyone and everyone. There wasn't a person in the world that, that Paul didn't think deserved to hear the gospel. So much so that you know what his number one priority was? To get to Rome so he could stand in front of the emperor Nero in order to share the gospel with him. That was his great hope, his great desire. And yet what we know, instead of finding himself before, before the Caesar, before Nero, he found himself imprisoned in Rome. In fact, all the circumstances around Paul's life and how he got to Rome, you, we, we would sit back and go, man, that's just not fair. It's not right. Because Paul was, first of all, misrepresented and mistreated. He was illegally arrested in Jerusalem, sent down to the coast at, Phil, at Caesarea Philip at Maritime, where he was literally went through a kangaroo court. He was then sent on a boat to Rome at the wrong time of the year. The, the boat was shipwrecked, if you remember the story in the book of Acts. Finally, he makes it to Rome. And when he gets to Rome, they have a prison for him, prison cell for him. And more than that, they literally chain him to one of the guards. That sounds like a good time, doesn't it? If there was ever a person who could say, I'm a victim of my beliefs, it was the Apostle Paul. And yet, I want you to listen to what Paul says. Paul says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brethren, most of my brothers and sisters in Christ have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. The first thing he says is it's important if you're going to have joy that you, that you remain fearless for the sake of the gospel. See, talk about a person with the right perspective. Talk about a person who, who looked at life as a glass half full instead of a glass half empty. It's the Apostle Paul. He saw his circumstances as opportunities for God to move and work through his life. No matter how good they were, no matter how bad they were, he saw his circumstances as opportunities for God to do something great. I love this word here, advance. It's, your translation may say to progress, but it's a word picture that's used to describe pioneer woodcutters who preceded an advancing army to clear a way through an impenetrable forest. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, but there's this huge scene in the movie Gladiator where they're going up against this Germanic forces, the Romans against the Germanic forces. And it's set in a forest, but as they come to battle, you literally see the forest has been cleared, that they're just stumps all over the, the, the battlefield. That's what these people would do, these pioneer woodcutters. They literally would clear the way so that the armies could come through. I think what Paul is saying is that in spite of my circumstances, God has used my life to clear the way so that those who come behind me, God can use them to proclaim the gospel. Now, wouldn't you love to say that that's what God did for my, with my life? God used my life to clear a path so that the glory of God could be revealed, so that people who were lost could be found, so that people whose lives are in, are in rubble could be rebuilt. That gives joy, seeing God use your life for even greater things. And so Paul prays this. But yet I wonder, how do we see our circumstances? How, is it, how do we see our circumstances as it pertains to the sovereignty of God and to the will of God? I, I, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. When I sit down with lots of people and talk with them, if something bad happens in their life, they're ready to blame God. 
not see it as an opportunity for God to do even greater things. They see it as something that they can't recover from. Instead of seeing how God can do even greater things. See, God can take that which is dead and give it life. God can take that which is broken and he can make it whole. And in every one of these situations, God shows that he is God and how he can be trusted and how he can be depended upon. And in that, we find joy. We find him. See, instead of seeing his circumstances as a setback, Paul saw them as an opportunity for the gospel to progress. Instead of seeing the soldier tamed to him as an unwanted appendage, I love this, he saw it as a captive audience. <laughs> kind of like that person that we sit beside on the airplane. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> Instead of seeing his struggles as a means to silence him, he saw them as a means to inspire others to speak and live boldly for Christ. I want you to notice this next phrase, though. Paul says, because of my struggles, brethren, the brethren can be confident to proclaim the gospel without fear. This was Paul's ambition. This is what caused Paul to get up in the morning because he wanted to see the cause of Christ move forward. He wanted every single person who walked the face of the earth to know that God loved them with an with an, a, a, an unfathomable love, that he loved them in spite of who they were. Even the Nero's of the world, he wanted to share the gospel because he thought no one was unredeemable. What do we think about that? The second thing that we see in this passage is that Paul remained focused. He says, if you're going to have joy, you've got to remain focused. Verse 15 to 18, he talks about some confusion. He talks about how there were people that did not do things the way that he would do them or really were kind of against him. I like what he, what he, his perspective on this. He says, in spite of the confusion, Jesus must be proclaimed. Watch this. He says, it is true, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry and others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true motives, Christ is preached. And because of this, I have joy. I can rejoice. Here's what I think Paul's saying. Paul's saying, listen, keep your eyes on the bigger picture. Keep your eyes on the bigger picture. We're not always going to agree with the church down the street. We're not always going to agree with the pastor next door. We're not always going to agree with the methods they use or the teachings that they have. But as long as it's secondary teachings and not the primary teachings, that's okay. We don't have to get turned inside out because they're neither against us and nor are we against them. But there is a line which cannot be crossed. Should a pastor, should a ministry mess with the message and change the gospel and say something like, you can get to heaven without Jesus, that's a problem. That's when we have to stand our ground. That's when we have to stand up and be counted. That's when we have to say, that's not correct. See, should a ministry alter or confuse the gospel, then we must step in and call them out. So when the Mormon church or with the Jehovah Witness say, oh, we're Christian, no, they're not. When you look at their fundamental teachings, they don't teach that Jesus is the only way, truth, and life, that he is the Son of God, he is part of the Trinity. They teach something contrary to that. They teach something that is heretical. And so we, as followers of Christ, we have to stand up and say, that's not right. We don't have to be militant. We don't have to be vicious. We're to do so in love, but yet we are to be firm. That is not the truth. The truth is that Jesus was God in the flesh, part of the Trinity. He stepped out of heaven in the flesh. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. And that there is no other means, no other mechanism for a person to be rescued from their sin. Because all of sin and come short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, no, not even one. There's not one of us in this room who earns the right to have God's favor. 
And so God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He became man and died in our place so that we could have life with him when we by faith put our trust in him alone. Can I get a witness? But also, when popular pastors say, oh, the Old Testament's irrelevant or unnecessary, no matter who he is, no matter who he's been, we should take a step back and question that teaching if we believe that it's contrary to the truth of the gospel. When the Rob Bells of the world step up, men who lead significant churches, and all of a sudden they abandon the faith, and they come up and they say, oh, you know what? You don't have to share the gospel. The gospel is for everybody. It's universal. It doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe something, you will get to heaven. And he abandons the canon that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. That's when we have to stand up and say, that is not correct. That is not correct. So it doesn't matter who it is. I want you to listen to what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy. He says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist, discharging all the duties of your ministry. What is he saying? I like the way Chuck Swindoll sums this up. He says, when people mess with the message, they need to be rebuked, exposed, and corrected. But when they mess with the messenger, and Paul was saying, when they mess with me, they just need to be ignored. Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus. And that's what we need to make sure we hold up high. There's joy in standing for the gospel because we know it changes lives. The third thing he says is that we need to remain fruitful. This actually goes back to what he said last week when he talks about remember your identity in Christ. I want you to listen to this. It's a little bit lengthy, but listen. He'll say, in spite of of earthly struggles, we have to keep Christ exalted. He says, yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers, And God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me, will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that no way will I be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. Do you hear what he just said? That Christ will be exalted. That Christ will be glorified. It's not about me. It's about him. Now watch what he says. So whether by life or death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if I'm to go on living in the body, watch this next phrase, that will mean fruitful labor for me. If you, if you mark in your Bibles, that's a good word. That word fruitful is a good word to circle or underline. Yes, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and join the faith, that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. What is he saying? He says a lot of things here, but I think the first thing he's saying is, it's not about me. I'm part of something greater than myself. Can I tell you one of the secrets to joy? It's not about you. Now, I realize that what I just said smacked in the face of your flesh. And I realize that what I just said smacked in the face of the American dream. But what Paul is saying, if you want joy, it can't be about you. You've got to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And you've got to be a part of Jesus. He says, my earthly, as long as I'm on this earth, my priority and my service is for Christ. I live for no other purpose but to see him glorified, to see him lifted high, 
so that all men can be brought to him. And he says, so while I know my days are short, until that day comes, until I give my, my life to Christ in death, I will give him my life in total and complete surrender. I will die to myself until I die in Christ. That's what he says. My life will be about him, and I'm not going to waste a moment. Every day, I want God to use, to bring fruitful results through my service to him. Here's the key word, though, fruitful. Paul isn't referring to doing something in his own ability, in his ingenuity. Remember, I said it goes back to what he said last week when he says, remember your identity in Christ. What he's saying is, is if you want to have a fruitful life, you can't do it in all of your ability and all your goodness. The only way that you can produce the fruit of the Spirit is to be plugged in and to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Paul said it this way to the Ephesians. He says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He's saying, don't be intoxicated by the things of this world. Instead, I love this, be DUI for Jesus. Dwell under his influence. Be intoxicated with Christ. You know, when, when someone gets intoxicated with, with, with drugs or with, with liquor, what, what happens is, is that they come under the influence. They, they, they stop remembering. They, stop, they, they, they lose some of the, their inhibitions, and they become under that influence of that toxin. God says, be, under the, be completely under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let Him guide you. And listen, the only way that happens is you have to be frequent with God. If you never pick up your Bible and, and study it, if you never read it, if you don't come and sit down and say, God, I want to I meet with you today, then you're going to have a hard time living under the influence of Christ. See, the more frequent you are with God, the more you're going to be on the correct frequency with God. And God wants you to be under his influence. He wants you to be plugged into him. He wants you to, to, to have a life that's inspired and led by his spirit. Paul said this way, the Galatians, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the things of the flesh. And so we have to walk under that influence. We have to walk plugged in if we're going to have fruitful lives. Hopefully I won't feed back. I brought a prop. John said this way, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If anyone abide in me and on him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. Let's just say that this is not part of an oak tree or pine tree or whatever kind of tree it is. And let's just say it's not a dead branch. Let's say this was the branch of an apple tree. How many of you think that this branch right here can produce an apple? Anybody? Why? It's not connected. Now, let's just say this, this podium was the, was the tree. And can it produce apples now? No, it's not connected. For this branch to produce apples, it would have to be tied into the tree, never cut off. For us to be fruitful in the things of God, we cannot be a branch separated from the vine. We have to be grafted in. We have to be into the, the very life flow of that tree, of that vine. And if we are, then our life will produce fruit. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's, or Paul's talking about here. He's saying, listen, we have to grasp that it is impossible to live the Christian life. It's impossible to live a fruitful life independent of the Spirit of God. When Jesus saves you, the moment you were saved, you were grafted into the vine and his life begins to flow in you and through you. 
And that's what produces fruit. And so Paul says to the Philippians and to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, if you want to be fruitful, walk in the Spirit. Be grafted in to the vine. Let your life be the byproduct, the overflow of what Christ is doing in you. And then last, he says, not only do you to remain fearless, not only do you to remain focused, not only do you to remain fruitful, but you are to remain fervent. Listen to what he says, verse 27. Whatever happens, I love that. We have no idea what the future holds. We have no idea what five minutes holds for now. But whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to underline that phrase, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. First of all, I want you to circle the word worthy. I love this word. Paul prays this same prayer for the, for the Colossians. And what he says, worthy, to walk worthy of the Lord, he's saying, I want your life to put a smile on God's face. That's the best translation. When you and I walk worthy, it causes God to smile. But then he says this, conduct yourselves. That word conduct is a very interesting word. In fact, when you read it, you do not get any sense other than to behave. But the word actually, the root word deals with your citizenship. And he's telling the Philippians, listen, you might be citizens of Philippi. You might be citizens under the rule of Rome. But your real citizenship as children of God is in heaven. And you can never forget that. Because no, more, no matter what happens according to the economy of this world, as citizens of heaven, you have the right stuff. You have the right source. You have the right strength. You have the right power. You have everything you need for life and godliness. And so then he says, so then whether I come and see you or hear only about you in my absence, I will know you stand firm in one spirit. That is together. Striving together is one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. And this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that God and that by God. Or is it been, or it, or, or it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I have. What is he saying? Paul's saying, listen, if you let your joy come from what this world can offer, you're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to be sustained. Because this world cannot offer you the joy that I can offer you. It offers you a piece of waxed fruit and calls it joy. I offer you a real apple and that's joy. Would you rather have the joy this world has to offer or the joy that Jesus has to offer? Well, that's just a stupid question, isn't it? And yet we see it happen all the time. And yet here's what happens. What Paul is saying is that if we're going to have joy, we have to seek first the kingdom of God and not the American dream. Remember I told you I was going to say something about voting? Here it comes. When you go to the polls on Tuesday, for those of you who haven't been yet, you can't go as an American citizen first. You have to go first as a citizen of heaven. Because when you look at your citizenship on earth, we tend to vote for that which is going to make our lives more comfortable, that's going to make our lives more convenient, and that which is going to cause, cause us as, as followers to not necessarily face so much conviction. We vote for things sometimes that are expedient so that we don't have any pain in our lives. But what God says, and I'm extrapolating here, that as citizens of earth who are first and foremost citizens of heaven, when you and I go to the polls, practically speaking, we should be voting for the things that Jesus would vote for, not for the things that we want to vote for if they're not in alignment with Jesus. And let me, let me take that a little step further. So I have a problem for people who go to the polls and they vote for death instead of vote for life 
when Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I don't care what your political party is. When you and I go to the polls, it's not about our personal preferences. It's about the Word of God and the will of God. And I truly believe that we will stand accountable when we vote for things that are opposite of the heart of God. And so I challenge you as you go, no matter what party you belong to, no matter what thoughts you have, your political party is Jesus first. Got it? Listen to what Paul's saying. How we live and what we live for matters because Christ's reputation and the validity of his transformational power of the cross are what's at stake. They're what's at stake. Our witness is what's at stake. And so he says, do not grow weary and lose heart. Don't attempt to live your spiritual life in the flesh, independent from the spirit and independent from the body. Instead, partner together to help one another fight the good fight, finish the race, and run the course. Partner together. And in doing so, you and I will find joy. That's what he tells us. And I was preparing for this, and I was really struggling with, Lord, how do I end this message? And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, 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 all night, all week, I'm like, I just don't have a conclusion. And this morning, I was in my office, and I was like, God, I still don't have a conclusion to this message. I need you to guide me. What really exhibits someone who is remaining faithful, someone who is going to be fearless, someone who's going to be focused, someone who's going to be fruitful, and someone who is going to be fervent. And I found this story, and when I found it, I was like, that's it. There's a story of, shared about, by, an, by a missionary to Africa about this woman who was one to Christ. And, you know, that, that in itself is, is incredible and miraculous. But this woman, she was blind. And this woman, she, she, had, she had other struggles. She could neither read nor write. And yet, when she came to Christ, she was like, God, how can you use my life? God, I want to experience the joy of seeing someone else come to Christ. I want to experience the joy of what it means to follow you, and yet I can't see to follow you, and I can't read or write. I, I don't know how I'm going to help you. And as she was praying, God laid on her heart to go to, to go to her missionary pastor, and she said, can you do me a favor? Can you open my Bible to John 3.16? And can you underline and highlight it? And can you mark that page? And so the next day after that, the, the missionary followed her because he was curious what she was up to. And she went to the local school. And as school was letting out, she stood there. And, oh, by the way, the Bible was in French, okay? She, she, she stood there, and as little boys were coming out, she would stop them. She said, can you help me, please? And as they came, she goes, do you speak French? And they would say yes or no, but most of them said yes. And she said, could you read this for me and tell me what it means? And they would read John 3, 16 and begin to tell her what it means. And she would turn and said, have you ever come to faith in Christ? And that day she led one boy after another boy after another boy to Christ because of her faithfulness to Christ. 24 of those boys that she won to Christ went on to become pastors. Because she was fearless, she was focused, she was fruitful, and she was fervent. And what she modeled for us is that there's joy in living and proclaiming the gospel. You want joy? Live for the good news of Jesus Christ.